So hello everybody and welcome to this webinar organized from the crop modeling community of practice and the geospatial community of practice. We are very, very happy to have you all here. Uh, I see that we have people from different parts of the world. Um, I hope you can see us and you can hear us right. If you cannot, please type it on the, on the chat. So can you can you write? Um, some people already wrote that they can hear us. So please do it. So can everyone hear us and see us? You you can write in the in the yes. Okay, cool. Great, great, awesome, perfect. Um, so um, before um we. Start Start. Um, I just wanted to let you know how this webinar is gonna happen. So uh, the speakers we have today have uh, awesome speakers, uh, Absim uh, experts, and they are gonna do a presentation. And after the presentation, you will be able to do some questions. So please type these questions. In, like you see in your in your screen, like one part which says uh, questions and answers. Someone I think already typed. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. So please, in this part, questions and answer, all you write um, the questions you would like to make to the uh, speakers today, and uh, we will be sure that uh, they will be able to answer as many as possible. So uh, Kai, I'm going to turn over to you in order you present the speakers, and thank you everyone for being, for being here, and thank you to the speakers for agreeing to put in this webinar. Yes, um, good morning, good afternoon, good night to wherever you might be sending. My name is Kai Sander. I work at CIMIT and I'm representing here the, the community of practice of, for crop modeling of the big data platform of the CGIR. Some of you may have heard about it and we have the pleasure today to be counting with four colleagues from Australia, working out of Australia experts on APSIM, one of the very important crop modeling packages that are available nowadays. And they have agreed to donate us some of the valuable time while they're attending a, a modeling um, conference in France, in Montpellier. I wish I was there, but unfortunately I have a flu. And as you can maybe hear, and I'm also working here and Briefly to introduce, if I make any mistakes, please correct me. Um, we have today with us Professor Graham Hammer from the University of Queensland, working at Buffy. Uh, we have Scott Chapman, who is also working in Queensland, but also a scientist at CSIRO. We have Karin Cheno, um, also at University of, uh, of Queensland, a senior research fellow, and we have Greg McLean, and interestingly enough, there's very little information online about Greg, so maybe you could say a few words. I wouldn't, wasn't able to see anything. All of you have published a lot, worked a lot on the Epson package, and we're looking forward to hearing more and hearing the answers also to the questions that people have submitted and that may pop up in this one. Thank you. Okay, Kai, do you want us to just uh, start the presentation? Yes, please. Okay, so uh, um, thanks for the invitation and I will just introduce the mystery Greg McLean, <laughs> who, who is there. <laughs> and uh, he's a research fellow working in crop modeling and um, sort of development of the models and a lot of the software and Corinne is on my right over there and Scott is in the back stalls there and uh, so I'll just go through this uh, presentation and, and then we can try to answer whatever questions there are a few questions that we had before that we we can try to answer as well uh, but what I wanted to do was briefly give you an overview of the AppSim platform um, and really how it fits into modeling and simulation of agricultural systems. I didn't really want to just focus on the software alone. It's not really how we operate. So the, there's a bit of history to the development of AppSim that sort of commenced uh, like about 30 years ago when the Agricultural Production Systems Research Unit, APSRU, was set up 
as a joint research unit between CSIRO and, and two state government departments from the from Queensland government. And that was actually, as I said, a collaborative research unit set up to look at um, systems analysis uh, solutions for agricultural systems problems. And we decided at the onset of that to build a software system that could simulate cropping systems that we were wanting to research. And um, mainly in, with the very selfish motivation of wanting something that we could use for our research on improving those systems. That um, APSRU collaboration continued for three or four phases for about 15 years. At, at that point, that research unit was, was sort of ceased, but we were all at that stage fairly involved in the development of the software and so continued through an arrangement called the APSIM initiative, which is what we now have, which is no longer a collaborative research activity, but we collaborate on the development of the software platform that you know as APSIM that we all now use in our research activities in the separate organizations. Uh, over that time, the University of Queensland joined mainly because a few of us moved from Queensland government to the university and the University of Southern Queensland Ag Research in New Zealand and most recently Iowa State University in the US have all joined as core parties to the APSIM initiative. So that's where it's at. Um, they're the members that I've just mentioned, so we don't need to um, continue with that. The, the APSIM initiative has a sort of number of uh, levels of governance. Um, there's a steering committee uh, made up of the sort of senior researchers or um, managers from the various organizations. And we employ the APSIM project officer, Sarah Cleary, who, who sort of basically runs the show from day to day. The steering committee really sets the policy environment and oversees the strategic direction and development planning for APSIM. But it's really the next layer down, if I can get that. Maybe. The reference panel um, who, who deliver the, um, the sort of oversight of the science and software development in APSIM and each of the organizations provides two members to the reference panel. You can see Corinne's a member of the reference panel and Greg has been uh, in the past as well. And so that group really oversees the quality assurance and um, any improvements that come into the system are checked thoroughly both for software and science before they can be incorporated into the AppSim platform. Um, the, the, you know, we, we have a sort of a, a strategic intent. So um, as I said, I was fairly keen to make, make it clear that the software is really a means to an end. And, and we're really looking at exactly this to capture developments in agricultural system science and modeling uh, within the software framework um, as a world-class research tool. And, and so, as I said, that was initially started out of our own interest, and, but we quickly saw that there were lots of other people around the world who were interested in accessing that tool. And so we're sort of happy for it to be widely used and hopefully as a, a means of enhancing innovation in development of agricultural systems globally. Um, and with the intent of providing um, benefits in those systems. As we're not that well resourced to have a global, uh, we don't, you know, we don't really have uh, any intent of taking over the universe with APSIN. Um, I said we built it for our own needs. It suits a lot of other people. And so there's lots of possibilities for capturing understanding from parts of the system that we don't know about so we built a system that can be like a knowledge bank and capture all those developments that can then be used by all. Um, at the moment, it gets used fairly extensively. So these are the number of, of, of downloads by, um, by country. Um, and you can see uh, there's a fairly wide representation. I don't know if you can see that scale down there. It's a little bit difficult. Um, but there's 
you know, some fairly significant users in, in most countries around the world, or at least this downloads, um, the number of users is, will be some subset of that. Um, once the, the, the other probably uh, metric of, of, of sort of um, value of the system is, is really the number of times it's been cited in, in publications. And this has just been sort of going exponential over, the, over that period and, um, and is now you know, very, fairly widely used and, um, and cited in publications for research on all sorts of system, agricultural systems topics. So the, the, the main thing about the, the, the model in, in AppSim is that it, it's, it's really focused around systems and the soil. So the original intent, and, and this really came from um, sort of views of people like Bob McCown, was you know, that the soil is the central focus and it's there all the time, and the crops and the seasons and their management come and go. So, and they will, you know, you'll find the soil in a particular state, uh, manage through a cropping season in some way and leave the soil in a subsequent state, which you then move into the next part of a rotation. So the, the system is built as a, as a cropping system model, not as a specific crop model that are, you know, specific crop models that are just patched together. Um, but certainly, you can, within that system, there are any number of crops with routines um, for the simulation of specific crops, and they now go right down to genetics in some instances. But you can also um, have livestock and agroforestry models in this system, as well as solid models of, of the soils. And so you can run uh, various fields, you can run a whole farm um, or, or a single field or a single crop. There's a very diverse range of modules in here of varying degrees of uh, complexity. So often these models are contributed by others and we just um, test their quality before they can be implemented in the AppSim framework. Uh, this was from the publication in 2014. So there's um, certainly a few more that have been developed since then. Um, and they're all listed um, on, the, on the website. Um, I'll, I'll hand over to Greg McLean, who's going to give you a bit of a run through the software issues associated with AppSim and um, the crop model template and how it, how it sort of hangs together in a more operational sense. Okay, so <clears throat> excuse me. There, currently, there's two flavours to AppSim. There's the AppSim Classic, is the one that we've been working on for many years, and we're developing uh, the new AppSim Next Gen, which is um, it has a lot of advantages. It, it, it could be a, a single language model. It'll be a lot faster. Um, it will work on a lot of different platforms. Um, well, that's what's saying. So the uh, the, the, the model is designed to capture all of the interactions. To be able to use the model, you, uh, the user interface is a, is a very easy drag and drop style of a, an interface. You can set up uh, different simulations and you can set up a series of simulations by um, adding nodes to the module, that's to the user interface. And within there, you'll see that there's a lot of different um, components. There's a meteorological component and there's various um, management components and cropping components. And the idea is on the left hand side you'll see the components and on the right hand side are the parameters that are used for those components to, uh, to be able to run a simulation. The, um, the, some of the user interface features um, which make it a, a, a very powerful and very easy use product, include the, the, top, the heading up the top of that uh, user interface, which is the controlling area. Um, down the bottom, you'll see that there's, um, there's a toolbar uh, that has a lot of toolboxes in it. So the toolboxes are where all of the components that you use to build the, um, 
the simulations are held. Uh, and there's a wide variety of those that include um, components for graphing and for managing your soils, uh, managing the agronomy of your, your simulation. And you can also set up your own toolbox down there. And um, in that you can include the simulations that you've put together or management components that you've put together. And those can then be portable and be sent to other people. Um, as I mentioned before, you, you, you can uh, set the parameters of all of the different components by um, editing, uh, entering values into the, uh, into the boxes on the right hand side for the different, um, uh, different modules that you want to work on. This is an example as a crop manager. And as you can see on the right there, you can set up the uh, crop manager to um, work on when you want to grow a crop and, and uh, different parts of that. The, uh, the output from the, the uh, simulations that you're running can be controlled very closely. Each of the components that you put into the simulation has its own series of output variables. So you can choose different variables to output. Uh, you can choose when you want to output those variables, whether it's on a daily basis or at the end of a simulation, it's all very flexible. The output is then sent to um, a file that you can use. It's a, a comma delimited file or a, just a, a straight text file. But AppSim also has a wide range of uh, very powerful graphing packages built into it. So you, from a simple graph, such as a, a graph to show um, the value of a variable over time, through um, graphs that allow you to look at distributions of long-term simulations. And you can also use the output from your uh, simulations to um, be inputs to other third-party products. This one here, this one that we use a lot in the development of um, AppSim and the development of, of different uh, traits within AppSim that we're going to look at. Uh, one of the really strong points of, of AppSim is the ability to um, put a manager in there. So the manager will control a lot of the different components that are going on during the simulation of your crop. There's two managers in uh, AppSim Classic. One is a simple script file that's uh, very simple and easy to use. And the other one is a much more complex, but much more powerful um, .NET based language script. And within that, you can do a tremendous amount. You can control the different modules. You could build your own sub modules within that manager script there. And, and people have done uh, modules that would look at biotic stresses and the like. And then that can affect the way that your simulation performs and the way that your crops grow or the way that your soils behave. Um, Graham mentioned that uh, we have relatively recently set up um, areas where you can simply set up a, a crop rotation system. So it's all sort of drag and drop to be able to set up a crop rotation, but you can also do that on a multi paddock basis. Um, that's all fairly simple and fairly straightforward. Um, it's worth mentioning, I suppose, at this point that we have a website uh, that you can use. You can download the product from that website, but there is also quite a lot of exercises on that website that you could look at if you wanted to learn a little bit further about how to use AppSim. And there'll also be notifications on the website when we run different training courses or different events. Uh, some of the uh, things that we might want to do when if uh, looking at a, a landscape simulation is, is factorials. So with the, with the factorial ability within AppSim, you can set up a single simulation and then make variations on that simulation. You can run the simulations in a number of different sites with different soils, with different starting conditions and different agronomy, such as fertilizing, sowing dates, populations and the like. And of course, each time you set up a different factor within that factorial that and the different levels that will add more simulations. So you can end up with a large number of simulations 
very easily configured through the factorial abilities of the of AppSim. Um, some of the products that are out there, um, public domain decision support. So Arm Online is a um, is a large database of simulations that you can interrogate to have a look at what might be applicable to your particular system. So if you were considering whether you wanted to sow a particular crop, this would give you some indications of what you could get from that. Um, we have different commercially viable, commercially decision support systems such as Yield Profit that uh, allows you to work out on a field basis in real time what the advantages would be if you varied your management. Um, in the USA at Iowa State University, Soterius uh, Arcantulis has set up uh, similar sorts of things to be able to forecast cropping systems. Back to, me. Back to Graham. Okay. So I just wanted to give some quick examples of uh, how we've used AppSim in some fairly, fairly simple cases so we don't take too long. Um, in, in looking at, for example, uh, a, a, a crop management or you know, genetics by management interaction for looking at adaptation of a crop or particularly how to manage it. And you know, we um, do a lot of work on sorghum in Australia. And so I wanted to just give you an example of how we might use AppSim to look at the issue of intensity of management in terms of its water use associated with changing row configuration or density or the maturity of the crop of the, of the genotype. And we can look at um, high and low intensity G by M systems. Sorghum in Australia is a fairly water limited uh, dry land crop, high rainfall variability, effective water use is really critical. We have some system possibilities where we use these skip row systems as ways of reducing the demand for water, but you also then reduce your potential yield and so you have these trade-offs. So um, if we do a simulation of this sort of thing, the, uh, the picture here is, is really just to show if we have three strategies, the standard strategy is what would be our conventional system, a medium maturing cultivar, 50,000 plants per hectare and one meter rows with every row planted. And the yield, that's the yield on the x-axis. Then I've considered two other strategies, a high intensity strategy where we increase the density and have a later maturing cultivar. So it will develop a bigger canopy and have a higher potential yield. And that's the blue dots on here. So that's the, each, each dot is a simulation from a hundred year climate record. And you can see the one-to-one -one line is where the standard strategy would be. And the high input one gives you this advantage in the high yielding years, but has a lot of failures in the poorer years. And I've put an economic break even roughly in there. So you could see how many times a grower in this environment would make a financial loss with that strategy. The, uh, the low input strategy is to reduce your density and go into some of the sort of skip row type systems. And that's the red dots. And you can see there's far fewer failures, but you also forego the high yield potential under the, um, in the good seasons. And so this is the uh, concept of the trade-offs that um, something like AppSim can quantify and in terms of the trade-off between productivity, profit and financial risk. You can also do this with environmental risks like soil erosion or uh, nitrogen um, fluxes through the soil. Um, and so this sort of information provides direct links with agronomists in terms of um, support for decisions by growers, uh, because it, in any one instance, there's no real right or wrong. It's just how much, <clears throat> how much risk do you want to take? Um, the applica other application I want to talk about quickly was in the context of breeding and we've been doing a lot more work. This group has been doing a lot more work in that area recently. And in terms of putting a, a dynamic crop model in between a lot of the information we can now get on uh, genomic profiling and phenotyping in breeding systems, 
and we can use the models to dissect uh, complex phenotypes and link uh, component traits back to the genetics and connect that back to the model and predict using the model what might be the consequences of genetic manipulation. <clears throat> one of the important things in doing that is to understand the environment. And one of the early things we did in relation to this, and Scott and Corinne who are here have been the forefront of that, was looking at using models to characterize environments. And so just as a quick example of that, again for sorghum, here's where sorghum is grown in Northeast Australia. We have a number of key sites, those green dots throughout that region, um, you know, which is about a thousand kilometers uh, north to south and 400 or so east to west. Um, and we can look at the local agronomy and soils in all of those practices and simulate what, what is the water stress environment that the crop would actually perceive. So we can take all these locations, the local soils and agronomy and simulate that. And you get these sort of patterns, which is where when we classify them into five groups. So each, each line on here is one simulation. The supply SD ratio is the supply demand ratio. So that's the ratio between the amount of water a crop can actually extract from the soil to the amount that's demanded by the canopy. And so as that gets below one, the crop gets more stressed. And so there are, there are sort of a number of distinct patterns that the environments in this part of the world fall into. And you can see there are some that have relatively low stress and others that have a stress around flowering and others that have a more severe terminal stress. Um, five is six is around flowering. So we can classify those environments into these sort of five groups. And that's um, useful then for um, helping breeders determine whether they're sampling the, those environments effectively. And if, if you look at particular locations, you can see, and so this is just um, three locations, and you can see, well, what frequency of those environment types in terms of stress patterns were sampled in these three places? And you can see that, you know, for example, Dolby, the blue one, has a far higher frequency of the low stress types, whereas Wewa has a far higher frequency of these environment type five, the terminal stress. And so, you know, when one's looking to sample particular environments or trying to get a multi-environment trial that samples these environments appropriately, you can get some idea of how to manage your, your breeding strategies. So that's one of the things that, that um, we've been doing with with models to connect with breeding. There's also been much more direct work on traits, which I won't go into. Um, so just to finish, uh, we, we really view um, modeling in the sense of, you know, being a tool to integrate research with practice in either agronomy or breeding or into policy or systems uh, research in environmental aspects. Um, so the idea is to really continually develop the system um, so that you know, it, it does connect with research and practice in a, in, a, in a sensible way to support decisions and issues that are the main problems that are faced in agricultural systems. So our real focus is on uh, solving problems. Building models happens to be a way that we get to do that. So we'll stop there and, and maybe we can uh, try to answer a few questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Graham and Greg, for this great presentation. So we received some questions um, <clears throat> when we launched the, this webinar and we are gonna start from some of these questions. And one question, the first one is, <clears throat> sorry, from Yehu, from IFRI, and he was also with you at the ICROM um, a symposium that took place this week and he say um, Gray made an important remark during his presentation this week about the importance of a credible model versus a credible modelers. Can you elaborate on the comment of, uh, to the webinar audience? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, in my presentation at ICROPM, I, I, I suppose I went a bit over the history of modeling and but I, I was 
concerned that a lot of people are using models um, probably without knowing a lot about them and, and doing a lot of extrapolation into either new environments or new situations where you're, you're sort of accepting that the model is credible. And so I, I went over what I thought was required to actually test the credibility of a model. And that required testing against a lot of field data. And so it's not like um, modeling is something that should be done in isolation from experimentation. It should be very closely linked to it. And if you want to take a model into a new situation, you really need to have good data sets to be able to test it. And there are various ways of testing it um, that I went through. I probably don't have time to go over the various ways that I thought you could do that, but there were certainly quantitative tests against experimental data but also qualitative tests against you know, the model being able to generate the sort of responses agronomically that you, you know should it, that, it should, that it should be able to generate. Um, the other aspect was about credible modelers. So it wasn't one or the other. Um, I think I was pretty well demanding both, that you had to have credible models and you had to have credible modelers. And a credible modeler really needed to know how the model worked before they undertook um, a sort of detailed analysis of a problem with it. Because quite often, you know, you can just grab a model and run it. And if you don't really quite know how it works or what it's doing or how to parameterize it, um, you can make some really uh, profoundly um, stupid results. So the, the idea is that, you know, models are quite complicated things. You need to have a, a really good understanding of how they work. Um, before you you go into doing detailed things with them. Now, that that's also means that they probably need to be somewhat better documented than many of them are. Um, I think we've tried to document things as well as we can. I, I think it's probably still not perfect. Um, but and, and it often requires interaction with people who have a better understanding of the models. So it's not it's not a simple, sorry, it's a long winded answer. It's not a simple issue, but it, it's probably just for people to be aware that, you know, don't just grab a model and expect it can do whatever you want it to do. You need, you need to test it and you need to understand what features it's got and whether or not those features are suitable to tackle the problem that you're interested in. Great, okay. So I think it was clear. So let's go to the second question. Uh, it was uh, sent by Step Aston from One Acre Farm. So thank you for sending the question. So he says One Acre Farm serves over 1 million farmers in Eastern and Southern Africa. We are interested in the potential to leverage Absin to generate real time in season recommendations on fertilizing timing, rates, splits, etc. The potential for Absim to do this at an individual field level seems obvious, but there is no way we could do that in a timely way given the numbers of farmers we have to advise. Are there examples or at least proof of con concept for this kind of thing being done at massive scale? For example, by aggregating sites of similar soil characteristics and or rainfall regimes, semi-automatic analysis in R, using cloud computer, et cetera. Okay, um, probably ag risk ARM or whopper cropper sort of stuff. Mm. Um, look, the, the, a couple of the products that we mentioned there sort of tackle this sort of issue. If you're not in a situation where you've got a system where you can run a real time responsive analysis like yield profit, for example, I mean, yield profit runs things up to a point in time and then projects trajectories out into the future based on weather forecasts, for example. And, and you can look at different scenarios and their impact in real time. Now that does require quite a bit of computing support to be able to do. Um, in the absence of having that capacity um, and the information to do it, because you need lots of information about specific soils and, and weather at, um, at, at particular spots. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you can do a lot of pre-packaged simulation and we, we have built a number of database products that enable you to do that. They're not quite as flexible in that, you know, you, 
you can't respond to an exact situation, but you can um, do millions of simulations and have them prepackaged in a way that can be accessible to look at what what if questions. What if I change my add fertilizer this amount? What if I change my management system somehow? And you can you can run the simulations, but you need to probably predict the type of management scenarios that are going to be thrown at you um, and just put them in a database with a fairly user-friendly front end that, you know, and somebody can interrogate and then send a message off on a mobile phone or however you want to do it. Great. Okay, so then let's go to the third question from uh, Carolina Jaramillo Giral. Uh, she also sent her question and her question is, is APSIM a geographic information system adequate to crops? So I might ask somebody else to answer this one because Corinne's done a bit of work on looking at spatial simulations. Yeah, so so uh, APSIM is usually um, used as a point-based looking at specific location but we can also use it to generate yield map, for instance, um, using uh, grids, climate grid or soil grid, and all soil grids. Um, then it's a question of accessing those, those grids. There are a, a lot of quality climatic grids in, for different regions of the world. It's more challenging in terms of the soil. Um, we've got some in Australia. There's also the FAO, which has a global soil database called the Harmonized World Soil Database. So yeah, we, we can do sort of um, yield maps in, in this way and we, we're we developing some tools to do, to do sort of uh, um, those maps more, more easily and in part using some uh, cloud computing. Good. Um, and then the next question from Rahul Vargava. Um, does APSIM work with individual session dat data or just average for genotype by environment by management? Yeah, I, I, was, I was trying to capture the, I wasn't quite sure of the intent of the question, but, but I, I think what we wanted to say was that um, certainly APSIM works on a day-to-day -day basis with data within the season. So, like the example I showed in the presentation, you know, each of the hundred points or however many there were represent one season. And so certainly we, we work closely with the individual seasonal data and the variability within the season and look at the strategy analysis of the averages and the uncertainty or variability associated with each strategy across the historical or projected set of seasons. So we certainly work on individual season data and, and then look at and anal analyzing that to do the scenario analysis to compare scenarios. Okay, so uh, the next question just came out uh, from Luan Pam. Uh, APSIM is only for annual crops, right? Or can it be used for perennial crops? Uh, there's a number of perennial crops already in there. I know there's people, um, Neil Huth and co, working on, on tree crops and there's some horticultural crops. Scott, you know, have any? Um, I think there's a range of perennial crops, cassava, um, others in there. There are some. There are also some vegetable crops in there. But, um, most of those, you need to contact the people who develop them to to see the latest versions and Neil, Neil Hoos is the best contact for perennial crops at CSIRO.au. And there's pastures and there's animals. And yeah, so that's right, perennial pastures, um, animal production systems. So it, it's quite comprehensive, but it, it depends on what specific perennial crop one's interested in, but it, it's got a whole range of them there. Including eucalypts. Yeah, including trees. <coughs> Yes, yeah, so um, this answer also um, replies to Leonard Rusinam Hotzi, sorry for the pronunciation of the name, who also asked that what is the progress of having apps in simulate perennial agroforestry systems? Yeah, so I think um, 
I know Neil Huth has been working a lot on that and, and, and there are some new developments. So I think he's either just published something on it or there's something just coming out. So um, certainly that's been an area of focus of his and um, I'm not totally up to speed on exactly the developments there, but there's certainly uh, those sort of systems in place because there's considerable interest within our group in developing capability on around some of the issues with agroforestry. Great, so just uh, check the references um, given by Graham and yeah. And then the next question is from, uh, sorry for the name, Chandra Sekar Viradar from Icarda and say, how Absin can help in transformation for a monoculture to diversified agroecosystems? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I think Absim, because of its focus on the soil, uh, is, is probably in a, in a good space to do this. But again, it's just another set of scenarios you need to look at in terms of what, what are the options you're thinking about in terms of going to a diversified system. Are you thinking about intercropping or, or what? And, and so there are a number of those aspects that can be incorporated um, and it, it depends what they are. Uh, so, and, and they will then have that interaction back to the soil. So you can look at, um, particularly with, with, um, with water and nitrogen, organic carbon sort of issues, probably not so much with other nutrients. I, I, I think the, the APSIM system can probably deal with um, in, in effects of systems on organic carbon um, and, and to some extent, um, you know, the soil structure through infiltration, through surface management systems. So I, I think it's got capacity to deal with some of that. It, it depends it's not probably not going to deal with issues associated with um, disease or weed control that you might want to get from a more diversified system. So some of those things would need to be considered a little bit outside of a simulation, which is, um, you know, you might design a diversified system because of some issue to do with disease or weeds. Um, but that's, those specific issues are not going to be simulated inside the system, although some people are playing around with um, simulating what the impacts of weeds and diseases are on some of these things. That's it's probably not a straightforward issue. So I, I'm, yeah, that that's probably I'm not you know without knowing a little bit more detail about what sort of diversification was of interest. I think Absim can deal with some of those things, but certainly maybe not all of them. Then the next question is from Anita um, and say, is APSIM used for the management of soil ero erosion? Um, yeah, sorry, I'm answering all the questions here, but yes, that, that was one of the main reasons that APSIM was built. So, so one of the um, state government departments in the original group for APSRU was, was actually the Department of Natural Resources and, and, and their motivation uh, was to bring the perfect model into APSIM. And it, it was based around looking at ways of managing um, surface, surface management of soils to minimize erosion through maintenance of stubble and minimum tillage. And so there was a lot of work done on looking at infiltration and erosion rates and experimentation on that in different systems that informed the development of the erosion and um, water routines in APSIM and it's been used for looking at rotation systems in our part of the world that would help minimize problems with erosion while trying to maintain profitability. It's another one of those trade-off issues. Okay, um, the next question comes from Sudesh Manali from the Amrita University in India. It's by providing minimum irrigation, will it be possible to raise millet or short duration post crops productivity? Um, again, it's certainly a question you could, you could throw at the model. Um, and so you're really just saying, I've got some ideas about a scenario. Um, the, the model 
has a water balance and an irrigation strategy manager. So you can play games with different levels of irrigation and in certain environments and see, see what would happen. Um, so it's the sort of question that it's probably ideally set up to do because you know your, your answer is going to be different every year. You could do some experimentation on those sort of things, but again, it's like a lot of agronomic experiments. You often get a different answer every year and the beauty of the model is you can extrapolate beyond your experience using your historical weather data to just see how particular strategies might, might play out. So you can certainly do that with different levels of irrigation in different systems. And the next question is from Hilary Mujigo from the University of KwaZulu Natal and is where can I download daily rainfall, max and minimum temperature? I might throw that one to Scott. I think we've got a number of uh, systems for, for doing that, um, certainly in Australia, but uh, yeah, yeah. There's, there are a lot of sources of that weather data. Um, one of the most commonly used one for the global simulations that people have used is called the NASA Power data set, um, which you can find on NASA's site if you type in NASA space power, P-O-W-E-R. And it's a 30 year daily record of weather data that's been infilled and used for, uh, using satellite data and other types of data. We can provide the link to that if you, if you want it. Um, but there, there are many other sources. Um, one thing about NASA Power is that we've, I've recently done an analysis in Australia comparing with our Australian data sets. And it's, it's fairly reliable when we compare stations that we know very well we compared about 300 stations between the, the global set and our set. It's a, it's a tiled data set, so it's squares of the planet. Um, the next question is also again from Step Aston, and then is, are there ways of leveraging AppSim functionality via R rather than using the software AUI? So, yes. you got that correct? Uh, yeah. Yes, you can, you can run AppSim many different ways. You can run it from a command line. You don't have to be using the user interface. We frequently will set up uh, large simulations by using clusters of computers and we'll send each of the computers the information that it needs <clears throat> and it will return the values. And you can use any number of different languages, R, can be done uh, frequently that you write your own script or you write your own programs. There's a product called PSIMS that you you can search on GitHub and it will put that sort of thing together for you. There are quite a lot of different ways that you can run apps in. So then uh, Luan Pot also asked uh, the same question about like how we implement input in R. So then let's move uh, to the next question from Barun Prab uh, Prabhakar. So are there any license restrictions of AppSim for commercial use? Sorry, what was the question? Are there any license, license restrictions? Are there any license restrictions? Yeah. For commercial use? Um, the, yeah, for commercial use, there is a requirement for a commercial license. So yeah, I didn't say that in the presentation and probably should have, we talked about public and, and commercial users. Um, so AppSim is freely available for public research and use and downloadable. I mean, it still requires people to um, sign a license because any improvements that they make or changes need to be fed back through the system. Um, and, and so there are some restrictions on making making changes, uh, be, mainly because we, we want to have a, retain a, um, a strong version control system and, and not have a, a number of sort of various versions um, happening. Um, but for the commercial licensing system, the, there's, it's explained on the website. So if you, if you go to the website, um, there, I think it, in the website, it'll, it'll be, a, it'll be clear that one to make commercial use is there's a 
uh, a license fee required. And that license fee is, um, I, I think we're just streamlining this process so that it will be fairly straightforward for people who, companies who want to use the product, to, who want to use Appsim to, to actually just download it and pay a license fee. Um, and, and we have a number of commercial users in that category at the moment. So the, the intent there was if people are using it to make, um, to make private gain, then um, they are required to, to pay a license fee and the license does impose restrictions on them in terms of not um, passing on the software to others or sub-licensing it. So that they can use it in their own business uh, they have they have an annual license that enables them to do that and they can do basically whatever they like with it um, but they can't on sell it or sub license it and they're required to pay the license fee. okay then the next question is from son darayan bankaru Zwabi, and is regarding the calibration of absin so how easy or difficult is to calibrate the absin for a particular crop and environment. Can I generate the calibrated model as an Excel file? As an Excel file. Um, yeah. As an Excel file. As an Excel file. Okay. Um, yes. Sorry. As an Excel file. <laughs> so, so I the the first bit on the on the uh, calibration. I mean we've we've had projects where we've worked with. Um, with people in, in ICRASAT and, um, and in um, organizations in, in Africa, Ethiopia, for example, where we've calibrated models using germplasm and environments that are quite different from the, from the situations where the model was developed. Um, and so it is really important in those situations to, to run a number of experiments to to test the model and, and to calibrate it for local germplasm um, and, and check that it works for different environments. That I, I think our experience is the structure of the models is quite robust in, in the sense that, you know, they, the, the crop physiology and, and the biophysics in the models is, is quite um, rigorous and, and, and the soil um, physics, but um, you really do need to test it experimentally in, in your system and that requires some, some sort of um, serious experimentation to collect um, reasonably good quality data. And that was one of the things I talked about at the talk in the previous question about model credibility. Um, you've really got to convince yourself that the model works for the system that you want to use it for uh, before using it and believing the answers. Um, so, you know, models are, you know, are good, but they're mostly okay and can be often wrong. So you've got to be, you, you really have to make the effort to do the experimentation to test it. Um, and so the, and, and in our experience that takes, you know, a couple of years at least for crops. So if, if I, you know, running a, running a, a project in Ethiopia, we'll, we'll get try to set up some experiments there where we, we measure the soils, we measure the crops sufficiently, we get the weather data and we can look at whether the thing um, works well and if it doesn't, why doesn't it? And then we might have to go and do more experiments to find out more about the local genotypes than we know um, to be able to use it effectively in those environments. Um, in the cases where we've done that, it, it's actually worked out really quite well. Um, but it's not just a matter of taking it and running it. In terms of the XE file, what would you recommend, Greg? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Can you, can you run it in an XE file? I don't quite understand what the question was. I answered it, sort of. Good point. What do you, have, what, what, what do you mean by an XE file? <coughs> no, can actually, you run the calibrated model in an XE file? I just explained that a single simulation is a weather data file combined with a simulation file and and an AppSim executable. So I, you execute AppSim with a weather file and a simulation file, and that simulation file can include all of your calibrated uh, set, setups. 
the exe file doesn't contain all the information in it. Yeah. Um, so I think we have time for two or two or three more questions. Let's see how much. So let's do the next question is from uh, Subhash Pillai and it says how we can use absin for intercrop modeling. Similarly, is it possible to use for whole farm modeling uh, for integrated, integrated farming system such as crop livestock plus other components, etc. Yeah, okay, so I, I think I'd mentioned AppSim is certainly set up to do that. Um, there are intercropping routines in, in AppSim um, and there are multi paddock uh, capacity to do whole farm modeling and we in, that include livestock and uh, pasture systems. So certainly the structure is there um, to do that and we certainly have done that in a number of instances. It, it depends on you know, the actual particulars of the system of interest. And I think that was in South Asia. So if you, you know, all of the components, if all of the components that, that, are, that you're interested in in compositing a system like that are there, then the potential is there to do it. Um, it, it may require some development of components if, if that's not the case. Um, great. And then uh, the next question is, um, which are, um, what is the main difference between Absin so, and DSAT? When is it a good idea to choose Absin over other crop models? Um, well, Absin and DSAT sort of have developed in parallel over a long period of time. Um, I, th I, th I think a number of the models have, have features in common. Um, and um, you know, in terms of the way they're structured, we've probably the probably the features of AppSim that give it a little bit of advantage are are in relation to that focus on the soil and the notion of the ease of which one can do systems and whole farm um, approaches, but also the work we've done more recently in uh, moving the crop modeling routines to a level of biological functionality that enables us to connect with genetics a bit better. Um, so I, I, I mean both of those, both APSIM and DISAT are uh, you know, developed by groups who had interest in similar sorts of problems. Um, so I, I, you know, one probably if you've, if you've got access to support from one group or the other, that probably helps because none of these things are easy to use. Um, and, and probably, you know, there's no real straight answer to that question. Um, it, it, it depends on what you want to do and um, who might be around to help you do it or, or how easy you think the two systems are to get into for what you want to do. Um, okay, so uh, I'm sorry, like the attendees are asking whether we can ask two more questions, but the timing is, uh, we're running out of time. So I don't know if the, if the panelists are willing to reply one more question or... Okay, one or two more, we'll go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which one do you want? <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so then uh, the question is from Harry Banes Aldabe and say, what do you think about the role of the people who are learning about the softwares for agriculture, precision and agriculture production? What could be the role of them in those years? And could you mention some softwares that you recommend for usage? Learning about software for precision and production. So is this precision agriculture question? Um, yes, it's uh, for yeah, precision agriculture and agriculture production. I mean, I, I think APSIM is a point-based model, so it, it can be 
you can use it to look at what what are the implications of um, variation you might have across a field if that's what the question is trying to target here. Um, it's not really set up to do um, spatial analysis of fields that might vary in a, in a certain way with soil properties or something. Um, you could certainly play with it to look at the implications of that. Um, but it's, and I, and I think, you know, some people have, have, uh, have looked at doing that, but, but, but usually understanding the variation in the inputs, soil inputs across the field for precision work, there's, there's probably more value going to remote sensing sort of applications with UAVs or whatever to, to pick up spatial variability across a field and, and see if one can classify areas of a field. Um, I, I think if it's, <clears throat> if it's a more generic question about the future of uh, roles in those kinds of applications, then you know, agriculture technology or ag tech is a rapidly growing area of investment. So there's a lot of commercial opportunities for people to work in these types of areas of uh, precision ag and, and making advice for farmers using combinations of satellites and, and models, including AppSim-like models. Um, but I don't think that we, any of us would be confident in forecasting whether there'll be a lot of those jobs in the future um, in, in terms of the way that that investment turns out. We'll see. <coughs> Okay, so and just the last question that I think is going to be fast from Luke is that does APSIM account for water loading effects on crops for, for example, in barley growth, grain yield? Um, yeah, we're, well, it, it does for, uh, for some. It, actually, it's, it's good because the most recent um, entrant into the APSIM group from Iowa State uh, this is one of the reasons that they they engaged because they were doing work with maize soybean rotations in the midwest of the US and and finding that the model simulations were generally good but often not not that not that good and this was mostly related to the fact that this the the soil system that we had didn't handle um, water table effects and and water logging effect extremely well um, and so Soterius at Iowa State has built in to the AppSim system a, um, a, a really good water table um, prediction system. So you can um, look at anaerobic, you know, the, the effects of water logging on, on soil due to uh, water table depth. And once he's done that, he, he's his uh, simulations in those maize soybean systems in the Midwest have been uh, remarkably improved. So that's one of the things of, you know, in our systems in Australia, we don't often run into water table problems. We usually are struggling with water deficit problems. Um, and so it is good to have that sort of system where someone's got a quite different problem because of the environment they're in and and, and are able to add a feature like that um, to enhance the capability of, of the system to model those, those sort of situations. Admittedly, at the moment, that's only been done for that maize soybean system, but, but I'm pretty sure the way it's been done is, is sort of generic in, in relation to water movement through the soil and uh, development and, um, of, of a shallow water table. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Unfortunately, there is no more time for questions. We are a little bit over the time. And so I just uh, want to turn over Kai to just like say like a final wrap up. And I just want to thank you very, very much for your kind um, presentation, your clear presentation and for answering so many questions. There are some questions that has not been answered and let's see whether we can get them answered and after the webinar. So thank you very much, Kai. So I turn over to you. Thanks a lot. Yes. Thank you, Annabelle. Thanks for organizing this. And many, many thanks to the four speakers. 
for donating your valuable time and giving us some insights. Um, certainly a very interesting time for crop models at the moment, lots of interest, climate change, lots of challenges in the future. Um, as mentioned in the seminar, one has to be very careful in using crop models, thinking to think it's very easy to use them, but lots of pitfalls there, uh, lots of abuse possible, but lots of potential too. Um, talking about data, Scott already mentioned some of them. Um, we are exploring at the moment the, the Copernicus data set, era 5, 1979, basically to, to date daily data, specifically for models and such, can be easily downloaded from the European Union's website and there's a lot of additional stuff and the resolution is slightly better than, um, than NASA Power, so we're switching at the moment to that. Obviously, it has to be looked at. There's also a lot of validation data, but in terms of data accessibility and availability nowadays, things are improving basically daily, so very exciting times. So many thanks again also to the audience. Thanks for your interest in participating here. As Annabelle mentioned, we will try to answer all the questions and of course the video of the webinar will be available online. So good evening, uh, good afternoon, and good morning again to everybody and thanks a lot to all participants, especially to the speakers. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. <laughs>